so uh, in first lecture today, uh, my goal is kind of try to bring you all into the same level of the general knowledge because uh, you are people from uh, all sorts of the, the backgrounds, uh, biology, medicine, and so on. So we are going to discuss uh, the backgrounds and data sources in biomedical uh, industry and uh, sciences. So the lecture is going to be split into two parts. Uh, in first, I will give you a little bit of introduction from the biology point of view, and then Katka will take up uh, and uh, give you the other part uh, dealing with the medicine. Uh, given the hybrid uh, type of the event, uh, if you have any questions during my talk, please type them into the Discord. Uh, we will try to answer them for those here uh, in the room. Uh, we will also take the question ready at the end. Uh, it will make it easier for us because uh, we are going to be two speakers. So as I said, the goal for today is to provide you an overview of the data sources in biology and medicine. And here, when we talk about the biology and medicine, uh, we are talking about the different scales. Uh, these data sources and the analysis of the data, uh, we are dealing with uh, ranges from the simple atoms, going through the molecules, genes, and so on, to more complex uh, systems such as organisms or even populations of organisms. And here is actually going to be a nice talk later on, on Tuesday in the evening by Helwig Hauser, who will actually again, take you through all these scales, but this time from the physiology point of view. So when talking about the data in biomedicine, uh, we are talking about the two types of data. Uh, we have experimental and we have computational data. The thing with experimental data is uh, that they are quite expensive to obtain. So they are often used uh, at the beginning of a research uh, to kind of, as an input, uh, of obtaining the initial data or for the validation at the end of the pipeline and all the gaps in between are filled with these computational simulations. So let's start with atoms. Uh, when we're talking about the atoms uh, for the big part of, the, of this week, uh, we are going to consider them as the smallest unit of the ordinary matter. Uh, when we're talking about their size, we often use uh, units called angstroms, which are pretty much just 0 0.1 nanometer and uh, to give you an idea, a hydrogen atom is about one angstrom uh, big. Sometimes it's 0 0.9, sometimes it's 1.1, uh, depending on the literature you read. So when we're studying the atoms, uh, this kind of fills in the realm of particle physics, uh, where the physicists are uh, trying to understand the composition of atoms. So what they do, uh, they create two opposite beams in some uh, colliders like the one uh, in CERN, and they just collide the particles uh, at very high speeds against each other. The problem with this uh, is twofold. Uh, the particles actually decay in uh, very complex ways, and making analysis of these data is very cumbersome for that reason. And second problem is uh, that these uh, colliders can actually generate uh, billions of collisions uh, per second, uh, meaning that they can generate petabytes of data. So you can obviously see that nowadays the bottleneck is the analysis. It's not the data generation part in this case. But in biology, uh, what we are mostly interested in are properties related to the life. So uh, types of uh, properties such as uh, what elements the atoms have, uh, what mass or shape uh, these atoms take. Uh, but perhaps the most important are valence and electro negativity, which defines how the individual atoms actually bound together uh, to create more complex molecules. Which brings me to the other point uh, on my scale list, uh, molecules itself. Here, the biologists are focusing either on smaller molecules, which could be you know, new drugs uh, for the medicine purposes, uh, inhibitors, or activators, which are molecules allowing us uh, to regulate uh, some processes, and so on and so on, going towards more uh, larger molecules such as proteins. Uh, these large biomolecules are actually uh, considered to be building blocks of all living organisms. And they have also uh, its use in industry. And therefore, for the uh, large part of this talk, I'm going to focus on those. And uh, actually, uh, Edward Girl here will give us a, a nice talk later on, uh, in which I believe uh, he will describe how we can simulate these uh, very large environments on the cell level, on the atomistic levels. But let's talk about what these proteins actually are. Uh, so 
they consist of the amino acids and they create a pretty much, you can think about them as a linear chain of these amino acids. Uh, to find out a constitution of a protein, we can uh, employ multiple, uh, multiple techniques, uh, among which is, for example, protein sequencing, uh, where we have the advanced degradation technique, which allows us to kind of cut out one amino acid by one and find out which one uh, is that. But perhaps from the data point of view, uh, more interesting uh, types of analysis would be, for example, spectro mass spectroscopy or spectrometry, uh, which is kind of interesting because what the people do there is they take the molecule, they smash it to the pieces, and then they can weight the individual fragments. Uh, what is output of such analysis is a spectrum uh, like this one down here, which tells us uh, average evidence of a particle fragment with the particle mass. So on the x-axis, we have a mass of the fragments and by this peak, uh, we can actually find out what the protein consists of. So this is uh, why we are interested in the uh, mass of individual atoms because we can then find out and compare the mass of the fragments with the overall protein to find out its constitution. The other way how we could analyze the protein would be to predict uh, their chain of amino acids directly from the DNA uh, because uh, they are actually encoded and transcripted uh, from the DNA uh, in the process called uh, gene expression we will talk about a little bit later on. So for DNA uh, what is important for you guys to kind of uh, know is that there are these four nucleobases uh, adenine, guanine, cytosine and either thymine or uracil depending on whether we're talking about the DNA or uh, RNA and from the kind of analysis point of view, what is uh, challenging here is to find out where on the, uh, this large DNA uh, individual proteins or the encoding of individual proteins starts. Why this is kind of challenging is because, for example, the human genome have about three billions of these pairs. So it's hard to uh, kind of sequence it all and actually find out the most interesting parts. So when we know what the protein consists of, uh, we can start thinking about its spatial structure. And here we will start with the basic building blocks called secondary structures. Uh, these are pretty much reoccurring uh, regular arrangements of, of these amino acids. Uh, perhaps you have heard uh, names like uh, alpha helix, which is this one, where the amino acids are pretty much arranged such that they form really a helix in, in 3D space. Uh, we can also talk about the beta sheet, uh, which is kind of a formation when we have this zigzag uh, formation of amino acid forming a, a sheet of, of those. Uh, if they are unstructured, we usually call them coils, but there are many more of these types, uh, but these three are pretty much the most important ones. How we are going to find out what secondary structures our protein have? We have two options. Oh, the most common ones are these two. So we either perform uh, absorption spectroscopy, uh, which is kind of interesting technique when we beam uh, an electromagnetic radiation onto our protein and we actually see what wavelengths uh, the protein absorbs. And from this we can read uh, various or uh, estimate various properties of uh, proteins, including the constitution of the secondary structures. The other technique would be to do this uh, computationally, which is the most common approach anyway, uh, using uh, algorithms such BSSP or SST and so on. The only problem with these techniques is that they expect us to actually have the 3D position of all the individual atoms. And this is described by the tertiary structure of the protein. Uh, so it describes the actual shape and positions of individual atoms within the protein or within the single protein chain, because the protein can actually consist of multiple chains, uh, which is then uh, yet another level. So how we can find out what the protein consists of? There are a plethora of uh, experimental techniques which would allow us to do so, but I'm going to talk only about the X-rays, uh, NMR and uh, cryo-EM because these three are by far the most common ones uh, in this realm. And then of course, uh, we have uh, molecular dynamic simulations for the in silico approach. So X-ray crystallography, how this work? The idea here is that we take a protein and we try to make a crystal of it. And once we have a crystal, what we can do, we expose it to a ray of, uh, to, to a beam of X-rays, and we actually 
uh, collect the diffraction pattern which is appearing behind this ray. So you can think about this as I have a prism and I have a beam of light and then suddenly colors appears at the other side, right? So this is the same thing. Now what I do, I uh, collect these diffraction patterns from the different angles and uh, by uh, computational technique, I can reconstruct uh, a density map, which is this blue part uh, up here in the image, which tells me the mean positions of individual atoms. And then because I know that uh, the proteins consist of about uh, 20 or 22 uh, amino acids, I can fit in these amino acids into this uh, density map to create the actual 3D structure as we know it. This technique has uh, several problems. Uh, one of those is that it's very hard to make uh, the crystal for some of the proteins or for some it's even impossible. And second, uh, because these density maps do not include information, for example, uh, about the hydrogens, uh, it requires uh, some uh, thorough validation in the end because it's the pro whole process is kind of uncertain in this respect. The NMR spectroscopy uh, is a technique uh, which utilizes an idea that if we put uh, the protein or individual atoms into a magnetic field, they actually start to behave as a small, small uh, rotor, small magnets, and they, and they have some kind of a spin and start to produce uh, electromagnetic signal, which may look like uh, this one here. And this signal is specific for the actual functional groups. So if I have a different composition, this signal is going to be different. So what we can do, uh, we can again have a look on the spectrum and analyze these spectra, decompose them and find out what uh, parts uh, our protein consist of. And finally, uh, perhaps the most promising technique in the recent years is uh, electron microscopy, which allows us to actually nowadays see the individual atoms. Uh, unfortunately, this technique is not well suitable for the biomarkers because uh, first, they are not uh, very sensitive to the, uh, they, are, they are very sensitive to the electron radiation and second, they actually don't really like that much uh, vacuum, which is needed uh, in the chamber uh, for this technique to work. Fortunately, some smart people came up with an idea uh, how to solve these problems. Uh, so what we do is we very quickly uh, freeze the sample in the liquid nitrogen. Uh, and by this, we are kind of protecting it from the vacuum uh, itself. And then we use just a small amount of electrons to avoid uh, the damaging our sample. By using a a little or just few electrons, uh, the quality of the imaging actually suffers. So what we need to do is we need to have a huge amount of sample uh, or proteins in our sample and we collect all the information and average it together to get something like this. Well, as you can see uh, on this image from 2010, uh, the resolution is uh, not that great, uh, but because uh, we have the individual orientations here, we can use the computer tomography, uh, so the thing uh, you probably know in, from the medicine as well, to generate these 3D shapes. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, as the technology is getting better and better, uh, we are now able to reach almost near atomic uh, resolution. So you can see the difference between uh, 2010, and this is the same molecule from 2019. So we are getting there uh, very nicely. And this is what the molecule actually looks like if we look at it uh, in, the, in the microscope. So that would be the, the experimental part. And now let's talk a little bit about the computational or simulation part. So uh, here the most prominent uh, way how to deal uh, with the shape of the protein is using molecular dynamic simulations. So we start by the chain and then we have, uh, we employ uh, uh, the, the model uh, based on, on, the, on, on the network model based on the flexibility of the protein to actually s uh, simulate the, the shape of the protein. But when I'm talking about the MD simulation, I want to stop by and talk about the protein dynamics in general. So this is quite interesting part of the research happening here because uh, it is important to understand the protein uh, function, uh, especially because the dynamics of a proteins are actually uh, tightly related to its function. Uh, here are two techniques that are used. One of those is uh, the MD simulation. You can see up here what this technique is actually doing is uh, really simulating uh, Brownian motion on the atomistic level, uh, allowing us to study uh, all the interactions uh, and so on. Uh, 
The problem with this is that it's computationally expensive, it can take up to the dates, uh, days uh, on supercomputers. So the other way how we can analyze this is uh, NMA, normal mode analysis, which decomposes the uh, possible movements of a protein into the individual modes uh, and allow us to study the flexibility. It's a cheap method which allows to compute the same things in about a second, but it doesn't give us the atomistic movements. It just gives us probabilities or ideas how the protein could move potentially. The thing with uh, exploring the MD simulation is uh, that uh, nowadays it's not a problem to compute hundreds of thousands of frames. Uh, and since all the events are happening on different scales and we don't mean to miss any, uh, looking at such simulation could take us uh, quite a long time. If we speed up the simulation, sure, we can now watch it all, but it starts to become uh, problematic to actually understand what is happening there. So again, some research is necessary in order to understand how to visualize uh, the temporal data. So the challenges in terms of molecules are uh, in data acquisition that these techniques are kind of uh, sensitive to signal to noise ratio. They are quite uncertain and we, not, we need a lot of validation. Uh, from the data analysis perspective, uh, one thing we need to take care of is uh, the amount of the data we are taking. Uh, because for example, here I have just a few thousands of atoms, but I can barely see anything inside it. Uh, uh, we need to also somehow deal with the temporal data because uh, we need to, for example, present uh, or preserve the temporal coherence. So using some statistical values and so on is less useful. So here, uh, David Kotel on Wednesday will give us a talk about how we can actually deal with these large uh, 3D uh, visualizations. So I'm looking forward to that one. It's going to be quite interesting. Okay, this brings me to yet another level. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the genes. Uh, we have already discussed that uh, DNA consists of a nucleobasis uh, and the whole process of transcription and translation going from the DNA to the actual proteins, it's called uh, gene expressions. Uh, when we are talking about the genes, uh, genes are actually a part, a sequence of this nucleobasis somewhere on the DNA, which we know it's somehow responsible for some function uh, or transcribing some of these, or uh, creating some of these proteins. But before we could actually analyze what proteins are going to be created, we need to know the sequence of the individual uh, nucleobases. And this can be done uh, often through the sequencing. So either we use the, the older Sanger sequencing method or the next generation sequencing and so on. But irrespective of the technique itself, the result is pretty much just a long sequence of uh, letters, which uh, then needs to be analyzed and somehow taken care of. Uh, the biggest problem here is probably that every uh, each of us have some mutations in these genes. Uh, so, you know, you have dark hairs, you have blonde hairs and so on. This is represented by the changes of these letters. And there are just some random mutations. We actually have no idea what they are responsible or what they are doing uh, as well. So analyzing this is also kind of challenging. But more importantly, it's not just the sequence itself, but it's the actual 3D shape of the DNA. And I'm not talking about the famous double helix of the DNA, but rather about its com uh, or, uh, organization within the, the nucleus itself. So we need to take these two meter long DNA and fit it into uh, something small as a cell nucleus. And uh, there are other proteins involved in this packing process, such as histones, for example, and so on. And the overall thing here, uh, the, the whole fiber with all the proteins is called chromatin. So, uh, so and you know, uh, when David is uh, going to talk about chromatin, this is what he's talking about. How we can find out the conformation of a DNA, this packing, uh, there are typically experimental methods called uh, chromosome conformation capture methods. Uh, there is multiple of those, but if I oversimplify it, uh, the idea is that uh, we glue together the pieces of a DNA such that uh, if we uh, slice them to small, small pieces, the fragments which are close together, they stay together. And then we sequence these uh, small uh, small parts, and we try to fit them onto some general genome. Uh, what this results on is something called contact maps. So here on the x-axis and y-axis, we have the, the whole genome, and the color now tells us the probability of how 
how it's probable that the two particle uh, parts of the DNA were actually close together in our sample. A similar approach can be used to actually analyze what proteins were close to the DNA. So again, uh, in something called ChIP-seq, uh, we glue together the DNA and the proteins, we smash it to pieces, uh, creating a soup like this one, and then fish, uh, we fish out the individual proteins. And since they were glued to the part of the DNA, we take the DNA fragment with it as well. Then we can sequence this fragment, and again, try to fit it uh, where it belongs uh, statistically on the, on the whole genome. And which give, uh, this then gives us the probabilities or the regions where is the high probability in our sample that the protein was uh, near that uh, DNA. So it was probably somehow responsible for some processes there. So the challenges are here uh, twofold. So from the data acquisition, uh, again, these techniques are kind of uh, uncertain uh, and costly. And from the data analysis uh, part, we need to deal with multiple uh, uh, levels of, of details or multiple scales, because uh, experimentally, uh, it's often not uh, possible or it would be too costly to kind of compute these contact maps on the individual resolution of individual nucleobases. So usually a point in this map is about 10,000, 5,000 of these nucleobases. And then what we do for this chip seek analysis, which is you know, very much targeted to, to a particle protein. So it's cheaper and easier to do this in higher resolution. So we can do so. And then we need to find a way how we can correlate these data together on vastly different scales. Okay, uh, the other part of the talk should be interactions. Uh, and there are two types of interactions. There are either individual interactions between the molecules. So for example, protein ligand interactions or protein protein interactions, or there are a whole networks of interactions called uh, serial signaling. So for the individual interactions, uh, we have experimental and computational uh, means. For the experimental one, uh, these techniques can tell us whether the interaction occurs and uh, actually where exactly it occurs, because we can change the protein and find out whether it's still reacting or not. But these processes are very expensive uh, and it's kind of um, doing that uh, huge amount of those, uh, it's not going to pay off. So therefore, we often employ the in silico parts when we simulate these processes. They are cheaper, but they are also less precise, meaning that we probably need to more of these uh, simulations to kind of get a statistical overview of what is perhaps happening inside. What is the advantage of these approaches is that they, they actually can tell us how exactly the interaction is occurring, which is not possible in the experimental techniques, or at least not most of them. So here is an example of why the analysis of this data is problematic. So here we have a docking where uh, the scientist is trying to find out the interaction between the green and, and blue proteins. However, the tool is computing multiple of these possible conformation. And now the biologists need to go through all of them to figure out which are the most probable, uh, which are biologically possible and so on and so on. If we put them side by side, they become too small and we can't really analyze them. If we put them on top of each other, well, we don't see much either, right? So this is again quite challenging and we need to find a ways uh, to visually analyze this. And then we can uh, go uh, scale up towards the cell signaling. And here what you see is a network of individual interactions uh, which are kind of happening uh, inside the organisms. Uh, so any point on this network could be broken and could be responsible for diseases such as cancer, for example. And then, uh, so analysis, or there is a lot of research happening also in this respect, when people are trying to find ways uh, we could look into these large graphs, uh, maybe study them with respect uh, to, to the experimental data uh, and perhaps uh, found ways to, to fix those broken parts uh, to treat uh, those diseases. Which brings me uh, quite nicely towards the cell scale, uh, where the, the most or uh, the very common uh, analysis which is performed is uh, gene expression. So the idea is that we want to know uh, what types of proteins we have inside our cell. So we could figure out what perhaps what these proteins are responsible for if we have a different uh, types of cells uh, from you know, uh, 
of disease patient and from the healthy patient, we can compare the amount of the proteins and perhaps find out uh, that some of them is doing something uh, not so good. So what we have here, it's pretty much a huge table uh, telling us how uh, many of a particle protein uh, were expressed or being present, if I say this way, uh, inside our cell. And what more, uh, we are also interested when exactly inside the cell these proteins are, right? So because it can even uh, better give us an idea what the protein might be responsible for. And here we can utilize two techniques. Uh, one is uh, electron uh, uh, cryotomography, which is pretty much similar to the cryo-EM we already saw. In this type, we are just freezing the whole cell and uh, trying to evaluate uh, and look at it at electron microscope. Or we can use staining uh, because we are getting towards the level which is possible with the uh, visible light microscopes. So we can stain our proteins to see where they actually uh, appear in different stages of the evolution. Uh, or not evolution, uh, but like the growing stages of this embryo uh, over the individual days. Uh, there's going to be a nice talk by David Svoboda on Wednesday. Uh, he's actually going to talk about uh, how to augment your data for machine learning. But since he's also quite interested in the image processing on cells, uh, I think you will see some interesting uh, cell images there as well. Okay, uh, if we just jump up one level up, uh, we can talk about the populations of cell. And here the technique which is commonly used is cytometry, which allows us to study the individual properties uh, for each of the cells. So for example, we can study how many uh, uh, cells of specific type we have in our sample, what is their DNA content, what is their morphology, size, and so on and so on. When studying these data, we often employ high dimensional reduction techniques because this is a uh, highly dimensional uh, data sets, which then need to be somehow looked at, uh, which is done through techniques like PSNE, UMAP, and so on. And here again, on Wednesday, uh, Maria Ganuza will give us an overview of uh, looseless multidimensional visualization techniques, which uh, are kind of useful and interesting in this respect. So the challenge is on the cell level, it's pretty much we have multimodal data because uh, we want to use the imaging data uh, and combine them with some other experimental data. At this point, it could be blood test, uh, uh, protein expressions and so on and so on. And we need to somehow combine all the information together uh, and get some, some sense out of it. And also, as I said, the data are high dim highly dimensional. So uh, the visualization of those is uh, not really straightforward. And with that, uh, I'm getting a little bit out of uh, my area of, of uh, uh, understanding. So I would give the word to Katka to kind of take you through the rest of the scales from the medical point of view. Now, no, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Hamza, for a uh, nice representation on the bio biological scale. And uh, as you said, uh, I will now continue uh, with uh, the site on uh, medical data. I'm actually reusing slides that uh, Nuska Smith prepared for this presentation last year. So thank you, Nuska. I noticed that you are watching. So I hope you, I don't butcher your presentation too much. Uh, so uh, let's let's take a look. So uh, the goals for visualizing medical data can be uh, quite uh, different. Uh, we can visualize data for education, for communication with patient, uh, diagnosis, uh, treatment planning, or treatment guidance. Usually uh, the reasons why we actually get the data are this middle three. So either to diagnose uh, the patient or to uh, plan the treatment or guide or change uh, or navigate through the treatment. Uh, and depending on what kind of uh, uh, disease we are dealing with, uh, what kind of body parts we are dealing with and things like that, uh, the techniques uh, for the acquisition of the data and 
the data sources themselves differ quite a lot. Uh, so uh, Nuska used this nice, uh, a nice, uh, a nice way to bring this, uh, introduce this presentation that this is like a train ride through a biomedical data zoo, uh, because there are a lot of uh, biomedical, biological and uh, medical data uh, that are being used. And uh, if we are going to go into detail about uh, all of them, then we'll be here for a long time. So you can imagine this presentation as being this train ride through different uh, exhibits in the zoo where the exhibit is individual uh, data types. And uh, to get a more in-depth uh, understanding of these data types and what uh, can be done with them from visualization point of view, uh, you can attend the lectures and they, they, are, they will be discussed in more details. Uh, so uh, back to the scales. Uh, Jan left off at the cell level scale and I will continue with the tissues. Uh, so there are a lot of different tissues uh, that can be collected, uh, the tissue, the tissue data that can be collected and tissue sources. And there are different ways of getting these tissues. So the first and uh, most kind of natural and least invasive one is expression. Uh, and uh, that's, as I said, that's the least invasive because it's kind of the things, the tissues that naturally come out. Uh, so urine, stool, saliva, vomit, and so on. So these are the, the one types of tissues that we can collect. Uh, and then uh, we can have uh, excision which is a bit more uh, invasive, basically meaning uh, involves a kind of cutting uh, where we can have different types of excision. For example, puncture, uh, when you use uh, a needle to, for example, get a blood, sam blood sample or uh, lung, fluid, lung fluid, amniotic fluid, fluid and so on. Or you can have scraping, for example, to get a sample of tissues from your cheeks or from uterine cervix. Uh, you just scrape the sur surface of the of the of the tissues, and then another kind of special kind of excision is biopsy. And the difference to this previous two is that in biopsy we are trying to get a bigger piece of uh, tissue as a whole, so bigger consistent uh, pieces of tissues. This can be, for example, bone marrow, brain, skin, liver, uh, and so on. And so when we are talking about biopsy and the tissues uh, that we are looking uh, at uh, collecting in this way, uh, we usually talk about histology or histopathology. In histology, uh, we are looking more at the anatomy of the, of the individual tissues. These tissues uh, are, or this can be healthy tissues. When we are talking about the disease tissues, when we are looking for some pathologies in the tissues, then we are talking about, about histopathology. So that's just a brief introduction. If you hear these different terms, uh, that's the difference between them. And the process actually doesn't end with just sticking a needle in and collecting uh, the, the, the tissue itself. Uh, it actually involves a lot of additional steps, uh, such as uh, fixation to prevent the tissue samples from decaying, uh, selection and trimming to select the parts that we want to uh, observe, embedding in, in a so-called embedding media, for example, uh, wax, to make it a bit more firm, to be able to uh, slice and work with these tissues a bit better than sectioning, where the tissues are sli sliced into very thin layers. Uh, uh, then they can be stained to bring forth some, uh, some uh, uh, characteristics of the tissues, some parts of the tissues, and then uh, they can be, uh, they are typically scanned uh, in a high resolution images where they can be observed under microscopically. When we are talking about digital histology or histopathology when they are scanned. Uh, so this is an example of how such a tissue that is stained can look like. This is a human lung tissue stained uh, with two chemicals, uh, hematoxylin and eosin. And uh, the dark blue parts of this tissue are uh, cell nuclei that are highlighted with the staining. Uh, the red parts are red blood cells. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, data that you can have from tissue collecting, uh, the image-based data, but you can also have additional data types uh, such as tables that involve some uh, numerical uh, values, measures, and so on. I'm sure you uh, had at some point your uh, blood sample taken and then you got as a back as a result of these huge tables with uh, uh, lots of uh, terms that no one really understands. So 
uh, that's another uh, kind of uh, data that you can get from uh, from tissue uh, for tissue collecting. So images and uh, then non-image data. And so what are the challenges connected to uh, analyzing tissue-based data? Uh, the first one is when you're trying to reconstruct back to this whole 3D image of, of the tissue. So not, not just one slice, but to get like this 3D uh, representation. Uh, because they are cut into these individual slices, then you're trying to stack them back together. And because they are soft typically, uh, and can get deformed or teared. Uh, there is the problem with uh, deformation when you're trying to put together these deformed slices and uh, register them together. This can be a very challenging uh, part. Uh, then uh, these images are typically very high resolution. And so there is need to have a good interaction technique to be able to zoom and browse and pen in these images at different levels of details, uh, which typically is, uh, we solved uh, at least partially, but using this kind of pyramidal uh, image formats where you have images at different resolutions, kind of simulating these microscope resolutions when you zoom at 10 times and to zoom at 100 times level and so on. So also these pyramidal image formats uh, have this uh, kind, of, uh, kind of property. Uh, then uh, another challenge uh, that is often a problem in biomedicine in general is proprietary formats, uh, where each Microsoft code vendor basically creates their own uh, image format and then transferring them between uh, different devices and tools can be a challenge. Some work is already put into resolving this, uh, but I think it's still, still a challenge. Uh, then, of course, uh, with analyzing this kind of data, nowadays a lot of uh, automated image analysis methods are used and uh, a lot of artificial intelligence. Uh, so integrating this with visualization technique is another challenge. And we'll actually have a, a dedicated talk on uh, AI and visual computing for histopathology images on uh, Tuesday by, by, by Mark Vargas. Uh, so we will see uh, more about this there. And uh, another challenge can be integration in, uh, of this kind of tissue data with data at different scales. So you can have CT images more at the organ level and uh, you want to analyze and relate this tissue level data with the more higher level data. Uh, how to connect them, how to work with them and put them together is another challenge. So let's move to another scale and that is organ scale. And this is a scale where a lot of things are happening actually. Uh, in uh, medical imaging. Uh, so there are uh, very many different techniques for medical imaging, such as MRIs, uh, CT scans, or uh, PET imaging. And you can see that uh, they use varying uh, uh, electromagnetic wavelengths or, or, or different lengths of radiation to, to collect uh, and record these images. And based on this, they also have different results and different effects on, on humans as well. So, uh, starting with the first one, uh, one that is quite common, are, is uh, X-rays. Uh, X-rays uh, is uh, basically a ionizing radiation. That means uh, that's uh, harmful to, to us. Uh, so you shouldn't have X-rays just for fun, uh, because if uh, you receive a high dose of this ionizing radiation, uh, it can cause immediate damage uh, with uh, lower doses. Uh, uh, you don't see effects immediately, but it can cause later on uh, cancer, for example. So uh, that's why uh, usually you don't have x-rays un unless you really need them. And how it works is that at one side you have this uh, emitter tube uh, that emits the, the electromagnetic waves. On the other side, you have the, this projection plane. And as the, as the electromagnetic waves pass through the tissues, through, through, through your body, uh, some uh, tissues uh, absorb more of this uh, radiation, some tissues absorb less, and based on the amount uh, of the absorbed radiation, then on the projection plane, you have uh, the, the results. So you can see that, for example, air show up, shows up as black, uh, bones, which absorb a lot of uh, uh, this radiation, show up as white. Uh, this is uh, x ray of someone with hip implant, so you can see it showing up here. And there are a lot of different types of X-rays. You can have standard X-rays, 
you can have fluoroscopy, which is x-rays over time, so you have continuous images. And geography, when you actually inject a contrasting agent into the patient, and this contrasting agent then affects uh, how this uh, radiation is absorbed. Uh, so it can bring, bring forth some structures, uh, usually uh, blood vessels, uh, as you can see here uh, in this video, as the agent is uh, injected, you see uh, the veins become more visible. And another kind of X-ray is mammography, which is low dose X-ray used uh, for breast cancer screening. Related to this is uh, computed uh, tomography, which is basically a 3D version of X-rays. X-rays uh, on a rotating tube around the patient. And based on uh, this imaging from different sides, basically a 3D representation is reconstructed. Usually it is presented as a stack of uh, two d slices. So what you see in this animation here is uh, a loop through these slices as they move up and down. It's a, a slice, it's a CT scan of uh, human lungs. Uh, actually, you can see that one of the lungs uh, is more black than the other. That's because it's a CT scan of a patient with collapsed lung. Uh, and again, you can see similar to, to x-rays, bones become white and uh, air is black. Uh, what is nice about uh, CT scan is that uh, it has kind of this standardized or norma normalized uh, intensity uh, units, Hounsfield's units, and uh, they have assigned meaning basically. So they can differ a little between different devices, but usually if you have uh, intensities uh, around minus 1000 uh, Hounsfield units, uh, then uh, it's uh, air, uh, fat tissues, fatty tissues are minus 120 to minus 90, then zero is water, and 500 to 1900 is uh, bone, or surgical bone, the outer layer. So this is the nice thing about uh, cities. But still, it's uh, realizing radiation, so uh, not done just uh, as a, for example, preventative measure. Uh, you usually need to have some indication to actually have the CT scan done. A completely different uh, technique is uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And I will try to uh, explain it a bit, uh, even though it's it's a bit of magic to, to me as well. So uh, how this works, at least to my understanding, is that in, uh, in our bodies we have protons that have a, a spin, uh, spin that is in certain direction. And when a large magnetic or strong magnetic field is introduced, these magnetic fields for, force the, the protons to align uh, based on their spin. So their spin aligns in the same direction. So they are aligned in the same direction. And then uh, a radio frequency uh, pulse is introduced. And this radio frequency pulse pushes uh, these uh, protons out of this alignment. So it disrupts that alignment. And then how this imaging works is that it uh, measures uh, the energy that is released by the protons and, and the time it takes to these protons uh, when they uh, realign back to their original position. So after the pulse is turned off, uh, they come back to this original position and based on the time and energy that is released during this process, you get uh, these images, which is quite fascinating. Here, we have just a few examples of uh, what the MRI can look like. So uh, the A image is actually CT scan. So you can see the difference between uh, the CT scans and MRI. Uh, and B and C are T1 and so-called T2 weighted MRI. Uh, the thing about the kind of nice and also maybe not so nice thing about the MRI at the same time is that the results really depend on how you set up the imaging. Uh, so depending on different settings, different things can be brought forward. Uh, here you see that uh, liquids in one uh, one image are, are dark and the other image they are white. Uh, so in based on the setup you can highlight different structures or different uh, tissues uh, but at the same time you lose this uh, kind of standardization or normalization that you have with uh, the CT scans where you know that this level of intensity corresponds to these kind of tissues. With MRI this is not so straightforward. And uh, similarly to uh, previous techniques, you can have different types of MRIs. So we have, can have functional MRI, for, for example, um, brain activity, MR spectroscopy, MR angiography, again, with introducing contrasting agents, 
uh, to highlight some structures and so on. Uh, there are many different techniques uh, that are based on MRI uh, and it's quite powerful technique. Uh, another one, another technique that is quite uh, common and uh, widely used is medical ultrasound. Uh, similarly to uh, MRI, uh, it's uh, kind of non-damaging. Uh, so MRI and ultrasound, they do not uh, have this ionizing radiation. They do not use this damaging radiation. So it's quite safe. And uh, the ultrasound works on the principle of high frequency sounds. So you have a transducer that emits uh, this high, high inaudible uh, uh, sound waves and uh, then listens to their echoes. And based on these uh, reflections or these echoes, uh, the image can be reconstructed. It can be quite uh, a bit more difficult to interpret the uh, ultrasound images because they can be taken from uh, strange angles. And also uh, there is a lot of noise in ultrasound images, but it's quite powerful because it's very accessible. Uh, it's much more accessible than, for example, MRI. Uh, it's cheaper and uh, it's not damaging. So, so this is the nice thing about this technique. And again, we can have uh, different types of ultrasound. So we can have 2D ultrasound. We can have 3D ultrasound where if you scan from different angles, you can reconstruct the image. Uh, time varying ultrasound, as you can see here on the video. Uh, and then you can have also Doppler ultrasound, which is used for uh, measuring blood, blood flow, which works based on this uh, Doppler effect that you might know. Like basically, uh, if, uh, you're, if you have a moving uh, source, uh, then depending on the speed, and uh, the, the speed can uh, basically uh, modify the frequency or the pitch of the of the sound waves that are reflected of this source. And so uh, based on this modification uh, of the of the of the frequency, uh, we can measure uh, the speed of the blood flow essentially. Uh, that's a medical ultrasound. And then uh, Another technique that we can have that is kind of uh, from different point of view is nuclear imaging, where you can have PET or SPECT, uh, the single photon emission computed tomography or positron emission tomography. Uh, and unlike previous techniques, this doesn't work on uh, really shooting rays through people, uh, but more on uh, measuring the radiation that is emitted from the patient. And so how can we make people uh, emit uh, radiation uh, is by injecting uh, radioactive tracers and then uh, basically uh, using camera, uh, sort of gamma camera to uh, measure this, this radiation and see what is happening with the tracer. So how, what is different uh, here in, in this kind of imaging is that it's more on a uh, functional side of things. So it doesn't really capture uh, so well the anatomy but it captures what is happening in, uh, in the body. Uh, so for example, here we have comparison of uh, CT scan and, and uh, PET images, and you can see that CT is uh, quite high resolution uh, anatomical structure. And you see also a little bit of uh, pathology in uh, these uh, spots. Uh, on the other hand, we have PET image, uh, which basically, uh, shows us where the metabolic activity is or metabolic processes are happening uh, because the, the radioactive tracer is concentrating, concentrating in these places. And you can see that there are, uh, there, it's much less, uh, much lower resolution. You see several spots, spots where uh, these are concentrating. Uh, some of them are normal. So for example, here we have spleen, liver and kidneys. Uh, it's normal for, for there to be metabolic activity, but then we also have some uh, darker spots here uh, that indicate uh, some pathologies. So uh, this is often used, for example, to uh, identify a metastasis uh, in cancer patients. Uh, and then we also have uh, some devices to combine uh, these different techniques such as PET and CT, uh, where the hardware integrates two different techniques which is really nice both for patients because they don't have to go through several procedures. 
but also makes it easier to then work with the data because they, uh, it reduces the problem of alignment because the patient only sits in one position. And uh, uh, when you use different devices, then uh, it's kind of hard to, to mimic the same position. Uh, but it doesn't eliminate the problem of registration completely because there are some patient motions that you can't completely get rid of, such as heartbeat or, or breathing. So you don't want to stop those to get an image. Uh, so this can also pose some challenges for, for the re working with the data. Uh, so uh, now to the challenges of uh, the medical imaging. Uh, first one, artifacts. Sometimes uh, the images are imperfect. Uh, they introduce artifacts. Uh, for example, if you have metal implants, uh, in, in teeth, for example, and you have a CT scan taken or x-ray, uh, the, the radiation can scatter around this, uh, this uh, metal parts and create artifacts that look like some shining stars around them that uh, represent things that are not, obviously not really there. Uh, then uh, similar to these histo histological images, uh, we can uh, have interactive integration and we usually nowadays have uh, some automatic methods for the analysis of this kind of data. And um, this is uh, really something that is really at the forefront of, of the research nowadays, how to make use of uh, automatic techniques and artificial intelligence uh, to help us and how to bring users in this, into this process uh, and how to use visualization to connect it all together. And so on this uh, topic, we will actually have two other talks uh, one by Stefan Bruckner, who is already here, uh, and uh, one by Thomas Schultz, uh, will give us some examples from neuroimaging and ophthalmology. Uh, so also tomorrow. So we have a lot of interesting lectures to look forward to also tomorrow. Uh, another kind of challenge uh, is similar to what we have been talking about, this histological images from different perspective, integration with data at the lower scales. Uh, Registration, I have already mentioned this, uh, is always a problem when you are combining multiple data sources together, multiple modalities. And also another big challenge is uncertainty. Uh, mo many of these uh, imaging techniques come uh, with some imprecisions. Uh, there is also some uncertainty introduced with uh, pre-processing or post-processing of this data registration and so on. And it propagates through this uh, medical workflow, basically this analysis workflow. And so we will also have a special lecture on this uncertainty in uh, visual analytics. Uh, also, these are spatial data and there are some challenges connecting specifically to the rendering of uh, spatial data in 3D volumes, such as occlusion when one thing is hidden behind another, uh, lack of contrast or resolution uh, of our structure of interest. Some pre-processing and segmentation can help, help here, but Segmentation in itself is a challenge if you don't have enough contrast or resolution. So uh, that's uh, another problem. Uh, with MRI, I have already talking, you don't have this uh, direct uh, structure to intensity relation. And there is also field inhomogeneity. So uh, one value at one point and the same value at different uh, point in the data do not have to represent exactly the same type of tissue. Uh, with ultrasound, there is a lot of noise, so that's another challenge. So uh, that's for the organ scale. Now for the organism scale, there is uh, not uh, that much uh, done. Uh, it's, you can use techniques such as MRI, CT or, or PET for the whole body. It's not done so commonly, but there are some special cases. For example, for PET, are usually for detection of uh, metastasis in cancer patients. Uh, to see uh, the whole body and to know uh, where these are located. Or for, for example, for CT, uh, after a car accident, for example, uh, you don't, have, don't uh, know exactly where the most damage was done. You can get the CT scan done and see exactly what needs uh, the priority in treatment and what is going on. Uh, another kind of whole body uh, imaging technique that is only applicable to uh, deceased uh, bodies and this is the donated bodies is cryosectioning, which you can imagine if it's kind of this uh, histology in, uh, in large. Uh, so how this works is that uh, the bodies on, or, or of donors are 
prepared and then they are uh, embedded and uh, sliced in very thin slices that are scanned. And uh, then you get a very high resolution and high quality images also with color showing uh, individual tissues, uh, showing very precisely the anatomy. But of course, this cannot be done for uh, human uh, beings. So here is another example. The previous one was brain. This is a pelvic region of uh, visible Korean human, a female. Uh, this visible Korean human was one of these projects that uh, focused on uh, getting uh, this real cryosectioned images. Uh, where then you get this outcome like this. And uh, there are a couple of these data sets now, nowadays available. Uh, some of them are uh, accessible uh, freely. Another uh, kind of uh, data concerning the whole organism is from a slightly different perspective. It's non-imaging data, and that's electronic health records, uh, where you're dealing with a collection of uh, patients' health uh, information, such as medical history, medications uh, prescribed that are prescribed, test results, allergies, uh, family history of, of disease, uh, personal statistics, uh, things like that. So many different data types. And this in itself is, can be quite challenging to visualize and uh, to, to analyze because you have different uh, kinds of data. There can be also imaging data into this and then you need to kind of create this bigger picture uh, about the patient from these loads of the loads of different uh, different uh, records. And now uh, we are moving to the last scale, which is a population scale. We're looking at whole populations. Here we can have uh, many different uh, data, various different data sources again. Uh, the first one being screening, which is typically done as a preventive measure uh, of sorts. Uh, which is aiming to uh, for discovering diseases among populations uh, that uh, do not show symptoms yet. Uh, for example, to uh, find some uh, uh, individuals that are at risk of some disease. Uh, a typical example of, of this is cholesterol measurements. Uh, if you discover a person who has high cholesterol, then it's an indicator that they may be at bigger risk of cardiovascular uh, disease and uh, may, they may get recommended to uh, change something about their lifestyle or get some other tests done to see uh, if there is no, not uh, some other uh, problem related to this. Or also screening can be done to discover diseases in early stages or prevent, uh, prevent them, for example, for uh, mammography for breast cancer screening. Another uh, source of data at the population level are uh, cohort studies, medical cohort studies, which are usually large uh, research studies uh, with a lot of uh, subjects carried out over typically long periods of time. So we call them longitudinal. Uh, and uh, with cohort, we usually understand a group of uh, people who share some defining characteristic. So for example, a cohort of uh, gynecologic, gynecological uh, cancer patients and uh, these studies are done to discover uh, some common uh, characteristics or, or biomarkers that differentiate, uh, for example, people who have uh, mild disease progression with pe and people who have uh, aggressive disease progression, uh, what do they have in common, where they differ, what could be the possible causes for this difference, and so on. Uh, the data that are collected this, uh, for, for these are typically uh, can come in different, uh, many, many different uh, flavors, let's say. Uh, they can be self-reported in interviews, medical examinations, imaging data, and so on. And uh, we will have a special talk uh, by Lars here on uh, ensembles and cohorts in medical visualization tomorrow morning. So that's another thing that you can look forward to. Another kind of data type or, or source of data uh, that uh, belongs to this category is uh, public health data. We have seen a lot of this uh, being studied recently during the COVID. Uh, these are the kind of data that study uh, the whole populations in order to, for example, prevent some, some disease, implement some, uh, some uh, policies, uh, recommend some behavioral uh, changes to people, uh, for example, to limit uh, an outbreak uh, of, uh, of the disease. 
uh, such as we had seen in the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, for example, uh, keep distances and so on. So uh, this kind of data are typically are geospatial. So there is also this uh, uh, or geospatial and uh, sp spatiotemporal, uh, let's say. So there is this uh, location component as well as uh, the temporal component often included. So you both have this uh, geographic uh, data included in here and also this spatial component. And we'll have a lecture on uh, this topic on visualization for healthcare in the COVID-19 era by Alessio Arguello to, to tomorrow. So some challenges uh, that are tied to population studies and uh, population-based data. Uh, often the data are very large, so it doesn't make sense to look at uh, individuals uh, and you need some form of summaries, real summaries, aggregations, and so on. Uh, so that's one of the challenges. Uh, often, again, combination with statistical and automated methods for analysis is important and should be uh, integrated into also visual uh, analysis. And uh, the last challenge, uh, this quite a quite big challenge often, is uh, the data quality. Because the data are often self-reported uh, and collected at different institutions, you can help people who drop out of studies, who miss appointments, don't submit their questionnaires. Uh, because if, if the data are collected at different institutions, uh, then uh, there are some issues with uh, uh, standardization because different uh, institutions have different policies, different devices uh, for imaging and so on. Putting this all together can be uh, quite a big challenge. So I'm uh, nearing the end of, uh, of, of my presentation. Just a few remarks in the end. Uh, we have looked at this data from this scale-based division, but you can actually look at this data from many different perspectives such as anatomical versus physiological, uh, based on the uh, dimensionality of the data, measured versus simulated, this is what Hansa was also mentioning, uh, clinical versus preclinical data that is used in research and in clinical practice, and so on. And uh, also coming back to this uh, first slide that I had, is that the reasons for collecting this kind of data uh, are typically the middle three, the diagnosis, treatment planning, and treatment guidance. But uh, the other two points uh, of visualization are also very important for edu education and doctor-patient communication uh, are also can be sometimes quite challenging. And uh, for this, we will have two uh, talks uh, today. Uh, the first one by uh, Bernhard Prime on, na on narrative medical visualization, and then a talk uh, by Renata Raidu on uh, taking visualization off the screen uh, which I'm really much working, uh, looking forward to. Uh, so uh, you have a lot to look forward to. And just uh, last thing, uh, when you're working with medical data, uh, be respectful of them. It's personal data, it's sensitive data. So uh, be careful that you treat it with respect. Be careful that you follow the regulations related to it. If you got your data from collaborators and you want to publish some research done on this data, make sure your collaborators are fine with that because they might, they might have some additional intentions for the data and might not be too happy if you publish before they publish their own research. Uh, so just something to uh, be careful about. Um, uh, we will post the slides uh, to, to, to the Discord so you can take a look at this cheat sheet here. Uh, uh, just a remark that when you are working with medical uh, specialists, uh, it can be helpful to learn some of the medical jargon, to learn what anterior and posterior means and what sagittal and the axial planes are. Uh, so uh, you can uh, use, for example, this cheat sheet uh, because uh, when starting the collaboration with, uh, with uh, people from different domains, it's often people, meeting people that are speaking completely different languages. Uh, computer scientists, they know all about uh, visualization and machine learning and things like that, that doctors do not anything about. And they, uh, doctors have their own jargon and they know all about uh, this terminology that you don't understand. And it's important to try and make an effort to meet somewhere in the middle. So it's important also for you to try to uh, 
uh, make this effort to learn and understand their data as well. So uh, this is all for me. Uh, I thank you for your attention. And now we can have some questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Jan and Katka, for the great starting of our <laughs> summer school. Uh, and it's time for a couple of questions, if we are, have any. And actually, if you don't mind, I will start with one we just landed on a Discord from our remote participant. And uh, I just lost it now. Perfect. No. <laughs> uh, so it's from Shukrai Singh, who is asking, are there any open data sources for organ scale MRI and CT? medical uh, images segmentation, just a second, <laughs> or meshes. Uh, which repositories do people use often? I'm interested in, in, interested in brain data mainly. Uh, there are some of these repositories. I have to say that I don't have the, can't tell them on top, from top of my mind, but I will take some time to answer this question of Discord. And uh, I think uh, also some of the people here, like. Uh, maybe Renata also has uh, some tips for, for this as well, uh, that we can post these uh, links. So I think it's anyway easier to post the links there than try to name the, the website here. Yeah. So we will make sure to post the uh, answers. Yeah, I, I see that Nuska is already typing there. So yeah, I, I'm sure Nuska will know a lot about this as well. So yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you, you in Nuska. advance. <laughs> yeah, but we will make sure that you are having available sources over there yeah. in, in this chat here. Thank you. Uh, some other questions from you here. <laughs> so, were all the scales so comprehensive that, <laughs> or it was too much, just right? It's, it's a lot of scales going from it's a, it's, individual it's, atoms it's up to here. Over, overwhelming, and uh, it was just scratching the the surface actually. Yeah. So. Okay, so maybe I'll just add because Nuska already managed to <laughs> finish her typing uh, that uh, Nuska made an overview a while ago. So uh, she put a link to the Discord channel uh, and she also put some recommendations uh, for, for some other web page over there for public large data sets. So thank you, Nuska, once again. 